The Tolkien Road, Episode 26, The Lord of the Rings, Book 1, Chapter 4, A Shortcut to Mushrooms. Hi everyone, welcome to The Tolkien Road. On this episode, we continue our discussion of The Lord of the Rings with Book 1, Chapter 4 of Fellowship, A Shortcut to Mushrooms, in which Frodo, Sam, and Pippin continue their journey from Hobbiton to Buckland and get lost in the woods trying to elude the Black Riders. Chapter 4 is a strange chapter. It could be argued that it's the most uneventful chapter in the whole book, with no major development in plot and not much new information revealed. Nevertheless, Tolkien chose to include it, and so in this episode we consider why he did. We also examine the development of various characters, including Sam and Farmer Maggot. And on the haiku front, a surprise is unveiled. By the way, if you haven't already, please leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback on iTunes. We'd love to know what you think of the podcast. Enjoy the show! Well, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Tolkien Road. I am John Carswell. Along with Greta. Greta, how are you this evening? I'm super. How are super. you, John? I'm doing well. Doing well. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, so, we are here tonight to discuss Chapter 4 of Book 1 of The Lord of the Rings. Um, otherwise known as Four's a Crowd. Right? Yes. Yeah. Four's a Crowd. Yes. No, in fact, known as A Shortcut to Mushrooms. Wait, is this a chapter that directly follows Three's Company? Yeah, that's what I was getting at with the Forza oh, Crowd. Oh, so you, okay. Remember last time we were talking oh, about right, how... Yeah, how he should start each chapter, he should have the number of that chapter in the title. Yes. I say yes, Forza Crowd. It's like the first chapter should have been called Once Upon a Birthday, mm-hmm. and then the second chapter should have been called Too Many Shadows, Too Past. Oh. Too, too past. many. <laughs> too many... Too many shadows of the past. There you go. Too many shadows of the past. I was kind of going for a too fast, too furious kind of thing there. Oh, but yeah, I see. That didn't work out too well. No, it didn't. Sorry for the bad joke. <laughs> too, too, shadow, <laughs> too many shadows of the past. So, you know, we're kind of okay. going with the, um, you know, the number of the chapter fits right. into the title of the chapter. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, I get it. Kind of that I get it. corny little, little thing. Yeah, so then chapter three, it was three is company. So chapter four now is four is a crowd. Right. Never mind. Gosh. Okay. Way to, com- way to, way to completely blow a joke. Man. I thought you were being serious. Next time, use your joke voice. I didn't know I had a joke voice. Mm, you have a joke voice. Ooh, okay, I have a joke voice. <laughs> there All right. It is. <laughs> there we go. Hey, four is a crowd. Oh, ha. Everybody laughs along at home. Oh, ha, ha, well, ha, ha. We need to get that syndicated, like, laughter. The canned applause? Yeah, canned applause that, uh,. Or like the ching, you know, like the yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, to uh, so that people will know, including me, when you're making a joke. Right. All right. So let's just get down to business on this thing let's do because it. Um, there's not too much to chapter talk four. About, to yeah. Be quite honest, right? Chapter four is um, it's kind of well, I, I wouldn't say boring, but. Yeah, it's kind of boring. I mean, there's Except, not there's not much that happens in it, you know? Unless you're a mushroom lover, and then it's very exciting. But they don't even get that specific about the types of mushrooms. Well, that's true, but, but I was just trying to put a positive spin if, on the whole thing. If you thing. just get really excited by the mere term mushrooms, I do, because I never get to eat them, because that happens I'm the only person in my family that likes them. I like, I like mushrooms, just not on pizza. Really? Yeah. That's where they're best, on no, pizza. I disagree. Then they get all, like... Squishy and no, gross. Then they then you've eaten the wrong kind of mushroom pizza. Uh, of course. Well, then that's my problem. Is that I've eaten the wrong kind of mushroom pizza. <laughs> okay. All right. With the wrong kind of mushrooms on it. Hey, by the way, before we get all before we get all down to business with um with this chapter, uh, posted a, recently posted an article that that kind of you know there's a slight bit of overlap with with this article in this particular chapter. Um, so I wrote, you know, I, last week we talked, I mentioned a bit that I had been reading Laudato 
Laudato, Laudato C, which I can't say it. Laudato. Laudato. You don't have a very good Latin accent. I don't. Tom. I don't. I need to practice my Latin accent. Uh, Laudato C, which is the Pope's new encyclical, um, kind of known as the environment, pretty much known as the environmental encyclical, although it's about far more than just the environment. Um, but I wrote an article about the parallels between his thought and some of Tolkienian, uh, some of Tolkien's finer, the finer points of Tolkien's thought. Um, you know, Tolkien was kind of a um, is is sort of recognized as a proto environmentalist um, mm. because of his deep love uh, for for nature. Right. It, you know, I think Tolkien would have gladly donned the moniker tree hugger. Oh, um, I think he would have. He absolutely. loved trees. Yeah. He admits as much in somewhere else in one of his letters. I, I, I referenced this in the article. But he actually says that, um, he basically says, I love trees in no uncertain terms. Like, you know, I feel whenever I see harm done to trees, I feel the same way as some people do when they see harm done to animals, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So, anyway, go over to truemist.org and check out that article um, on... Laudato C and um, Tolkien's thought. So let me know what you think. Um, so, uh, hey, by the way, I haven't asked you in a while. Have you read my book? Nope. I did, however, start reading that article that you just mentioned. Oh, good. Well, at the current pace, you'll have that article done in a few months. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'll get to it once I finish Anna Karenina. Well, you know, that makes me think at some point we're going to have to, we need to go back to the Silmarillion and, um, and move ahead there. You're not taking me away from Lord of the Rings right now. Well, that's open for discussion, but we'll see Mm -hmm. when, we'll see when we switch back. We're not going to like stay away permanently. The the idea is to kind of do, do a couple of chapters over here and then a couple of chapters over here so that when we read the Lord of the Rings, we're reading it informed by the Silmarillion and vice versa, right? Right. No, I get that. I get that. I trust your I trust your judgment on that, but um, it's been really nice reading something a little more exciting. Like chapter four, a shortcut mm-hmm. to mushrooms. Still much more exciting than some of the parts of the Silmarillion that I've read. What? This is dialogue. Whatever. All right. Mushrooms. Let's do some. Uh, let's do some haiku. Yeah. Um, actually. See. I have a little surprise for you. Oh, no. Yeah. I have some... So I've been I've been working on a recording project this week, as you know, and so I've put together some... Oh, this is a good surprise! I've put together some haiku theme music. Oh, um, but I'm the best! Four different, four different versions, and, um, and, you know, we'll just listen to them here. They don't have any words. I might put words to them after we decide on one, um, but for right now they're just instrumental, so... Here's a uh, here's Tolkien haiku theme number one, and I do have a personal favorite right now, but we'll see what your personal okay. favorite is. So All hopefully right. this doesn't completely overwhelm the recording device. So I play this. Yeah, you can feel yourself getting I down am, like, some haiku totally with that. Man, that's awesome. I dig that. That's really great. Dude, that end is killer. Yeah. That's yeah. so All right. cool. Here's the second one. Wait for it. Oh, there it is. That one has like that definite like Asian kind of like I could see myself self dancing to this like in a Tokyo club, you know, like oh, right. like. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Alright, so that's number two. Here's okay. number three. I just wish I could get somebody to pay me to just sit around with um, GarageBand all day and and create little theme music like this. Keep going, babe. We'll get there. <laughs> so that was number three. That was number three. This is number four. This has kind of a uh, Miami Vice sort of vibe. Not there. Miami oh. Vice? It reminded me of something else.
That's pretty cool. Yeah, this one goes on for a while. All right. So, mm. what do you think? What do you think of all those? Okay, well, I, I think I can narrow it down to one and two. To one and I two? Think those are my top two. All right. I really like number two. I just wish that I'd have to wait so long for it. Like, <laughs> it wasn't that long. Let's try it again. Try it again. That bass line is pretty sweet too. I don't know. That's a really sweet bass line. It's just kind of, kind of dirty. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it just gets, you just like, it gets so low. You're just like you know? doing your thing. That's like, like the, that's like the golem of bass lines. It just wants to spend all its time down there looking, looking down in the, in the dirt. mountains. That's right. That one's pretty awesome. Okay, let me hear number one again. All right. I do love this one. Hmm. I feel like this is the like the dance moves are the best to this one, but we should have our listeners vote. We could. I'll tell you, my personal favorite is number two. Is it number two? Yeah. I do like them both. I, I feel. I feel like number two just says haiku. You think it does? I think it just says it's. I think someone would like be walking down the street listening to that, like, and just hear that come on and be like, "It's time for somebody to give a Tolkien haiku right now." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. Was that the one I said I could see myself dancing to in a Tokyo club? Yes. Okay, then that's got to be. All it. right, so it's number two. That, number, number two. Number two, it is. Good job. Right on, right on. Those are all really good, though. Yeah. We'll have to come up for some other segments so we could utilize all four of them some way or another. This is this is going to become a really long show if we start putting <laughs> in other segments. Well, we don't have to do all four segments every episode. Hey, hey, if someone has an idea for other segments, let us know. Yeah, totally. We can, uh, we're open to suggestions. Um, Tolkien sonnets. Hmm, that might take a lot more work. That would take a lot more work. I <laughs> can right. tell you right now, I'm not right. good at sonnets. But now we have our Tolkien haiku theme music, so let's just um, let's just play that again. Um, yeah, you can't get enough of it. It's impossible. Hold on. No, I, uh, I need to rewind. It's new come iTunes. On, come on. Oh, wrong one. There we go. Oh yeah, you know what that means. It's time for a little Tolkien haiku. It's time. It's time. Mm. Get your haiku on. Get your haiku on. Mm. No freestyle. No freestyle. <laughs> <laughs> that music's pretty good. Your freestyle too. It, it is okay. Haiku time. Yeah, yeah. All right. So All there right. You go. Wow, that was like the most awesome lead in ever. I hope we can like match our haikus to the awesomeness of that intro music. Well, so we had um uh so wait, we had some more people submit haiku this time. Thank we had you. our had our uh our buddy Josh. And it's okay for It's us okay to call him Josh. Josh. Yeah, he, he have, confirmed that. Uh he we said have it in writing. He said please like write or know it's okay to call me Josh. Awesome. Um thanks Josh. And um so he submitted a few haiku, and then um, and then uh, another listener, Mary Grace, submitted haiku as well. So sweet, yeah. So um, very cool. Yeah. So do we want to do theirs first, or do we want to no, do ours first? Because remember last time we talked okay. about this, and we're gonna let them go last because theirs are always better than mine. Yeah. Okay. All right. So so do you want to go first? Yeah, I'll go me? first. Or are we, we're not playing rock paper scissors. How many do you have? What's that? How many do you have? Um, I have three. The last right. one's kind of a joke, but... I have four, and none of mine are jokes. So I'm going to go first. Okay. I took this very seriously this week. All right, go. All right, here's my first one. Loyal to a fault? Maybe. But Sam's on a quest, and he can't turn back. Very nice. Very mm-hmm. nice. I like that one. Maybe he is loyal to a fault. That's what you know. Sam. That's why it's a question. It was Sam. a uh, yeah. Yeah, Sam. That's what I was asking. Is Sam loyal Sam. to a fault. Wise. <laughs> <laughs> Sam. Maybe. Wise. Rhymes with damn G. All right. Okay. 
hear you. Mushrooms and maggots. Quite a squishy combo, I'd say. Weird chapter, Ron. Weird chapter, Ron? <laughs> okay. Because he went by Ronald. Tolkien went by Ronald. Oh, so, funny. Weird chapter, Ron. Yeah. Oh, I thought you were talking about the guy from Parks and Rec. And I was like, how does he fit in? No. Okay. I, I thought it was like an inside joke for the Parks and Rec that I missed. Okay. That's pretty good. I like that. Mushrooms and maggots. Yeah. That's, I like that little oration. That's pretty cool. All right, here's my next one. Continuing on through brambles, bushes, and trees. Oh, I messed it up. <clears throat> Sorry. Redo. Can we play the music again? <laughs> okay. No. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Continuing on through brambles, bushes, and streams, dodging black riders. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah, I know. Nice. You didn't have to think about it that long, though. I knew it was nice. All right, here's what I got next. Okay. Reckon there's some deep things going on here. I have no idea what they are. (laughs) So I feel like both of yours have been jokes so far. Yeah. The last one is, like, the most jokey. Oh, funny. I don't know, like... This chapter just didn't give me a lot to, um, you know. It, it, hey, I'm looking forward to hearing our guest haikus because I feel like they probably took it, you know, a little they probably did. deeper than I, I was able it, to. I took mine pretty seriously. Listen to this yeah. next one. Yeah. Are you ready? Well, I was also, you know, I just written the haiku theme music and. Were you kind of like? Yeah, it was just so serious. It was such a serious process that right. I. Just, I had to, you know... You had to blow up some steam yeah. and... I mean, you know, I had, yeah. to, I had to make sure the haiku music was just absolutely perfect. I get that. Um, you only get, I can't you, believe you did that. You only really. get one chance in your life to get the Tolkien haiku theme music, right? That That is true. That so, is, that is you know, really I got true. to write in the actual haiku and I was just like... I'm like still kind of in shock about it. I just, I really thought that... I never thought that would happen. Yeah. Like, I thought you were just, you know, you thought it was a silly idea. Yeah. So thank you. All right, here's my next one. Not a joke, by the way. Is that part of the haiku? No, it's not. Okay. I was just preparing you for the seriousness of it. One you thought a foe in a time of great need may be a saving grace. Mm -hmm. Nice. So you're so you're. um... You're referring to Farmer Maggot there? Yes, I'm yeah. referring to Farmer Maggot. Yeah, nice. Yeah, nice. thanks. You know, it's interesting, Farmer Maggot. Um, Very I've been, I've been reading, um, it is, and there's a lot of interesting things to refer to there, but um, I've I've been trying to go and reference um, The Return of the Shadow, which is the history of Middle-earth volume that deals with the first part of the Fellowship of the Ring. Mm-hmm. So it's all of these like f- early drafts and everything of the different chapters, and um, apparently in the very first draft, um, Farmer Maggot is a lot like what he is now in the final version. But in the second draft of Fellowship, um, he was like really, really, ug- really ugly towards. Um, uh, we're gonna take a break. We'll be right back. All right, well, I'd call that a uh, a catastrophe. <laughs> Which is quite different from a you catastrophe. Yeah. You No, it was definitely a dis catastrophe. Dis catastrophe. There you yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. We needed that dis in the front. Needed that dis in the front. Uh, uh, kids. All right, so uh, interesting thing, though, in the second draft of this chapter or this section, um, Farmer Maggot is actually really like he like virulently hates Bilbo and Frodo. Um, oh, really? Yeah. In the and then, second draft, in the second draft, said? and then in the third draft, in the final version, he came back eventually to what we have now. But huh. just an interesting note about Farmer Maggot, and, you know, his development as a character. So even though he feels very so wait, a little bit one off, early drafts of this book. Yeah, of the fellowship. Okay. Of the fellowship of the Rain, yeah. So he softened. Tolkien softened Farmer Maggot. Well, he made, he he hardened him, and then he softened him, right? First first draft, he was kind of like what he is now. I see. Second draft, okay. he was 
Got it. He was kind of mean and nasty okay. towards Frodo and Bilbo. Oh, so, okay. Okay. All right. My last haiku. I was going to write a haiku about chapter four, but I fell asleep. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> I fell asleep. I see. I really didn't think it was that boring. It just like nothing really happened. I enjoyed reading it. Yeah, it, it. was. It wasn't boring. And, and I'm, I'm kind of being silly with these haiku. Um, uh, but we'll talk about that. We'll talk about chapter mm-hmm. four and let's hear your last haiku. All right, here's my last one. Yeah. Oh, sweet reunion. Three are now four. And the road, it goes ever on. Nice. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. Hey, I'm always a fan of using the road goes ever on. I, 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 yeah, I like, I like that. Uh, I like that little song. Yeah. Um, so let's hear good our stuff. Uh, good stuff. Oh, yeah, we got to do the listeners. Okay, good. Thank you for reminding me. I almost yes. just jumped ahead. Oh. Um, all right. So first of all, um, we'll do... Uh, Josh's. Let's see here. Did you find them? Uh, I'm working on it. Dead air space. Sorry. Dead air space. Oh, we need. Let's play one of your other theme songs for that. The finding, we have dead airspace. The we'll finding guest haiku theme song. Yeah. Yes, there you go. All right, here we go. Um, hopefully, I get this right because it's the first time I'm reading it. Three is company, but they were missing a fourth. One Mary Adoc. One Mary Adoc. Yeah. So, like, one Mary Adoc, right? They were missing someone. One Mary Adoc, right? Oh, got it. Okay, yeah. that's good. Yeah, good I stuff. I like that. Good stuff. That's really so that's good. Josh's first one, and then the next one is um, Shadows pursue thee, maggots hide thee from peril, mushrooms they gift thee. Oh, nice! I like it. Shadows. I like the. Um, uh, that's a good one. Shadows pursue thee. Pursue thee. Okay. Maggots hide thee from peril. Mm-hmm. Mushrooms they gift thee. I like that. Yeah. That's really good. Nicely done, Josh. Yeah, well done. Well done. All right, now let's do uh, Mary Grace's. All right. Um, I love getting guest haikus. That's yeah, best. this is great. Um, Send more. Keep them coming. Yeah, let's see. At some point, we might get to a point where we like um, uh, have so many that we have to we'll be choosing. <laughs> Or maybe we don't. Oh, maybe no, we're going to do our own the whole way through. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, it could be like a competition. See if your haiku is good enough to make it onto the show. Well, no, I, you know, we'll see if we get there. I'm just saying we, we'll have to figure out some way. Maybe a competition, but we'll have to. I don't, you know, I don't want to make Tolkien haiku like a cutthroat thing. You know, like cutthroat yeah. haiku. <laughs> cutthroat haiku. <laughs> With samurais and knives. Um. We'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Okay. Well, keep them coming, guys. These are awesome. All right. So, um, here we go. I And she sent me a note saying that the last one she sent probably goes better with um, the next chapter. So, so if you want to save it? Yeah, we'll save that one to the next chapter. So, okay. here's her two that go with this chapter. Okay. Three hobbits leave the elves, treading their path doggedly. A ring wraith screams... Mm. Three hobbits leave the elves treading treading their path doggedly. A ring wraith screams. She like yeah, I like that because she kind of spaces it over. She spaces the um, the syllables over. So it, if at first it looks like they're uneven, but mm-hmm. she gets it right. Five seven five. That's awesome. Good stuff. Wow, that's good stuff. really good. And here's the next one. A visit to a farmer. Mushrooms kindle new friendship. Night brings Mary. Ooh, night brings Mary. I like that. I do too. Mm. Yeah, I like that last little last little line there. Yeah. Can well you, done. That was really good. Well done. I like all of those. I'm glad we read them last because yeah, they put, they put mine definitely better than mine, man. Like even mine are better than yours this week, man. I know. I will. You know, I use, no, a, lot of, I I use like a lot of creative your, energy making those, I know, those theme I know, songs. I know. I, I, I liked yours. I, I like the lighthearted stuff. 
It's just funny, though, because you inspired me to mm-hmm. take it more seriously and to really kind of try to go deep and, like, write about themes and not just events. And now I'm, like, really trying hard to do that, and you're, like, just being a goofball. Well, I try to write about, you know, when I write my haiku, I try to write about the things that, like, really inspire, like, the I- different ideas or themes that I see going mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. And and I guess that's, you know, that's what we're going to talk about with this chapter is, like, what what's this chapter all about. But Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but l- one last thing, I want to mention one last little interesting tidbit um, before we jump into the chapter. Okay. So um, there's an in- there's a funny story about the farmer maggot. Okay. Um, so when Tolkien uh, Tolkien in 1958 um, went to the Netherlands to basically present to a group of Tolkien fans there and, like, give them a speech, and they hosted him for a dinner and everything. Mm -hmm. One of the things they included on the menu was maggot soup, which was mushroom mushroom soup, right? Oh, oh, okay. And apparently maggot is not, in, uh, in Dutch, is not the same thing that we think of in English, you know, when we think of maggots, right? Okay. Um, so Tolkien sees this on the menu and inst- instantly is like, "What am I going to be eating here?" Right? right. And so, and um, and he explained to the to his host, you know, what that would mean, and um, to an English like to you know to an English audience or an English group. Okay. And the host was like really embarrassed about it. Oh, um, but there was no maggots. No, no, no. It was, it was mushroom because soup. Because that's not what was, Dutch people think of. It was of. mushroom soup. Yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah, but they were trying to be you know cute with their naming, and so they named it right maggot soup after the farmer maggots mushrooms. Right, right, right. right. So um, just funny little story there about farmer funny. maggot and probably how and, and I was reading the etymology. Um, why he chose the name of I was I was doing I was researching that trying to find an explanation I couldn't really find a solid one but I did find something on the website Tolkien Gateway um, that's not cited unfortunately but um, but basically says that Tolkien didn't had no um, uh, it, the name maggot was not meant to refer to what we think of the you know larva or whatever you know like it was not it was. No, it was not that kind of thing. For some, it was just a name, basically, that he said had some kind of origin in the Hobbit world that's now lost to us, right? So, okay. Um, because remember, Tolkien this whole time is creating a lost English right. mythology, right? right? right. Yeah, um, yeah, he's yeah. working from he's he's postulating this as a possible ancient history of of England, right? Right. Yes. So, huh. there you interesting. go. Interesting. So, very interesting. All right. Well, let's take a quick break, and then we'll come back and we will discuss chapter four itself let's do it all right don't go away do you know the tale that tolkien called the kernel of the middle earth mythology baron and luthien is the story of an outlaw mortal and an elvish princess tasked with obtaining a silmaril one of the holy jewels of the blessed realm from the iron crown of the dark lord morgoth in my new book tolkien's requiem i explore the legend of these doomed lovers In doing so, I aim to provide a back door into the world of the Silmarillion for those who have struggled to give it a go. One of Tolkien's greatest achievements, the story of Baron and Luthien, deserves to be as well known as The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Get your copy of Tolkien's Requiem today by visiting truemyths.org slash baron. That's truemyths.org slash b-e-r-e-n. Happy reading! All right. We are back. We're back. We're back. We're back. Man, I want to hear the haiku theme music again. Oh, oh! I'll give you. All right, I'll give you one more listen. Oh, thank you. Alright, before people just start tuning Wait, out. All right. But the end! The end. Oh, okay, alright. That. The bomb. So yep. wonderful. Thanks. You betcha. Thanks for indulging me. You betcha. Alright, so Greta. John. What is the point of this chapter? 
What is the point of this chapter? Well, they need to get Mary in it, right? They need to meet up with Mary at some point, mm -hmm. right? Um, and they, uh, well, they need to get to the ferry, mm -hmm. right? So that they can continue on their journey. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. And, and, and I mean, I don't ask that question to put you on the spot at all. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just asking for your thoughts. Like, because as I read it, um, I don't, you know, it's it's just, it's hard to discern why this chapter, I could easily see this chapter being being one where lots of readers fall off the first time reading it and be like, what am I even reading? Like, what's going on here? Really? You know? um, yeah, just because, just because they're, you know, basically walking through the woods, they... Mm -hmm they feel a slight threat from a black rider a couple of times mm -hmm. um but never like a very like serious immediate one True. and um True. and the farmer um and, and, then, and then they go to the farmer's house and then they arrive at the ferry right mm -hmm. um and yeah stuff happens in there but i guess the reason i'm asking the question like that is um i i always feel you know being a literature nerd, being a a guy who went and, you know, just as a hobby kind of thing, chose to go get a master's degree in English. Like, nerd. yeah, nerd, seriously. <laughs> uh, I am. I, you know, whenever I read literature, I'm always looking for, like, the, the hidden meaning in it, mm -hmm. you know? And mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and this chapter is really elusive in that way. Like, there, there just right. doesn't seem to be. I was like, maybe it has to do with mushrooms. <laughs> And so I was like researching mushrooms and like trying to find about out about, you know, like are there any like the clues there? And um, these really mushrooms, or are they a symbol for something else? Right, exactly. But then I, you know, but at the same, but then I got to thinking like, Tolkien was the kind of guy who would just put in a chapter about walking through the woods yeah. and yeah, would. you know coming to a farmer's house who had totally mushrooms, would. you know, yeah. Um, and that's very much in keeping with his. With his literary theory, mm -hmm. right? I mean, he's trying mm -hmm. to create something that has a sense of of reality to it. Yes. You know? That's true. That's true. And on the other hand, I am one that actually does not look for hidden meaning. I just read to read. Mm -hmm. And if something, like, it has to be really obvious yeah. for me to pick up on it. So maybe that's why I didn't, you know... This chapter really didn't bother me. I was like, I, I really enjoyed reading it. I thought it was, you know, three pals walking through the woods and... You know, like, just, you, you I mean, there was some t character development, you know, you kind of see, um, you know, you, you obviously you get a really good sense of, of Sam and yeah. his courage and his bravery and his loyalty. Right. Right. To, uh, to Frodo. Like, I think that really is solidified in this chapter. I mean, I think it doesn't come as a surprise to anybody, but, you know, I mean, I think, you know, after reading this chapter, like, okay, Sam's in for the long haul, you yeah. know, like the only way. Frodo's getting rid of him is if he dies, right. right? I mean that's it, and so I think that I think that was really I think that was really important. And you see, like you already see too, the kind of the the strain that this journey and this mission is already having on Frodo. I mean, you see the way he snaps at Pippin at the beginning of the chapter, mm -hmm. right? You know, and Pippin's just like, hey, you know, I mean, Pippin he may be a little snarky with him, but certainly not being rude. And and Frodo just basically bites his head off. You know, and um, where are you referring to? Um, so it's it's very at the very beginning of of the uh, of the chapter, the first page. Mm -hmm. Frodo's just gotten up, and they're asking him about the black. Pippin's asking him, "Did you you know? Do you think we're going to see any more riders today?" And he's like, "Did you maybe learn anything from them about Gildor last night?" And Frodo's like, "Yeah, not really. Just just hints and riddles." And then, uh, you know, he asks, well, what about the sniffing? Did you ask him about the sniffings? I think that's important. And uh, Frodo's like, no, I didn't. And I'm sure he would have refused to explain anything to me if it really was important. And now leave me in peace for a bit. I don't want to answer a string of questions while I'm eating. I want to think. Yeah, I can right? see that. Yeah, that's and good. It's like, good heavens. At breakfast? <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, he's like, come on, dude. Like... <laughs> It's not, you know, it's it's only breakfast time and you're already in a bad mood. Like, really? And right. I put up with you the rest of the rest. This is not cool, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that I just shows that, yeah. how, you know, it's, 
you know, and they just had this really nice visit with the elves and, you know, went to an awesome party and now Frodo's just, it's like none of that even happened. He's just like, you know, biting his friend's head off for no reason. And um, so anyway, that's well, just my and, little two cents. Yeah, I mean, he, he feels the... He feels the sense, you know, that they're under pursuit. That's, you know, that's what it says right after that, that, you know, mm-hmm. um, it, um, the bright morning had not fan, had not banished the fear of pursuit. And he pondered right. the words of Gildor. Yes. Um, you know, so, um, yeah, it's, I think it's both the ring is maybe starting to have its effect, although it's very subtle so far, mm-hmm. but it's just also the sense of like, somebody's out to get me, you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. And it's like that that's horrible, pretty terrifying nagging feeling. Yes. Yeah. Um, like later on in the chapter when, um, when they all of a sudden they're just like you know it's really ominous. You know they are they already know the Black Riders exist, um, and it says Sam Gamgee looked back through an opening in the trees. He caught a glimpse at the top of the green bank from which they had climbed down. Look, he said, clutching Frodo by the arm. They all looked, and on the edge, high above them, they saw against the sky a horse standing. Mm-hmm. Beside it stooped a black figure. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, that would be pretty freaky if you're just like in the woods, oh, yeah. and all of a sudden you like look up and there's like a black, <laughs> yeah, you know, this figure shrouded in black standing next to a horse. You know, yes. you you can't make out anything except the fact that it's just large and shrouded in black. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, and they have no idea what it is, right? They have no idea what no, these black riders are. It's incredibly dangerous, and you know that they need to stay far away. Yeah, and avoid them at all costs. Yeah. Um, no, so so this is good. I mean, I I definitely um, one of the things I was going to say about the real, you know, about wanting to write something that has the sense of reality to it is that you have to include the mundane, right? Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to include the bits about walking. You have to include details about the natural world that they inhabit. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it comes off as you're just kind of creating stage sets, right. you know, for yep. them to move through, yes. right, as you tell a story. Yeah, it doesn't or as you, feel... As you, as you tell your narrative, right? Right, exactly. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel real. Like, it doesn't feel like something that could actually happen. Mm-hmm. And this feels like something that could actually happen. You know, you can feel yourself walking, you know, through the woods with them and getting, you know, scratched by the brambles and, yeah. you know, um, and all that. Oh, yeah, I mean, I can very much see, like, a lot of this in my mind's eye. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Because it is... You know, you've we've all been in the woods at different times um, in different places, and you can kind of see how mm-hmm. you know you, you can see the own your your own ex- you can relate your own experience of being in different places in the woods and of seeing things to mm-hmm. what they're seeing here. Yes, um, yeah. Like when they when they mentioned where they you know they argue a little bit right about whether or not to just stick to the road or go into the woods. And Frodo's adamant we need to go in the woods because. You know, that's first of all, it's a shortcut, mm-hmm. and second of all, it'll help us. We'll be safer than the Black Riders if we're not. You know, they're not going to. Ex- they're going to expect us to be on the road, so we'll be safer where they're not expecting us to be. Right. So once they finally figure out that they just, you know, Pippin finally gives in and says, "Okay, fine. We'll you know go through the woods." They they stumble. You know, it talks about them. You know, kind of sliding down the steep bank and going in the thick brush and mm-hmm. trees. And my first thought was. Ticks. Ugh, ticks. Yeah. They're going to get ticks. <laughs> yeah, that's, I'm sure that's the least of their work. I'm sure that's the least of their work, but that yeah. was literally the first thought that went into my head. I was like, I'm glad I'm not there. There's ticks. Um, yeah, what did you think of the uh, of Frodo's little retort to Pippin where he says, in that case, I'm sure Gildor would have refused to explain it. Well, that's what it, I was talking about earlier. Well, no, no, no. I'm just saying, like, you refer to it more as... Is you talked about it in the context of Frodo oh, biting oh, Pippin's head off, but yes. what did you? I mean, what do you think about the little jab that he makes at at Gildor, at Gildor and the elves there? You know, because he basically, mm-hmm. basically Pippin says that whole thing about the sniffing must be very important, and mm-hmm. he basically says, well, in that case, I'm sure Gildor would have refused to explain it, right? Yeah. I mean, what do you think about what do you think about that? Why does Frodo react that way? I think he's frustrated, and I think he I think he saw Gildor you know, as someone on his side and someone that could help him. And, you know, I mean, and Gildor did help him a little bit, but um, I think he's frustrated with how elusive Gildor was. He didn't offer him the advice that he truly needed and wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Well, yeah, and it's kind of like what we talked about at the end of last chapter. Um, Frodo is all of a sudden realizing that, you know, before he was, he had this, I think he had this view of himself that, you know, he was just this little guy and he had like Gandalf and if, you know, and there were the elves, Mm -hmm. Bilbo was well connected with the elves and all Mm -hmm. these folks, you know, to help him out if he, if he really needed to. Right. 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 And he's starting to like, Gandalf. first of all, Gandalf hasn't shown up when he thought he would. That's true. And now the elves are Mm -hmm. like, not giving him the advice that he feels like he desperately needs. Mm-hmm. And they're not giving him any clue as to what right. that is support further system going that on. That thought was there. Yeah. Maybe is, is not proving to be the support he thought they they were. Yeah, so he's kind of waking up into this reality of mm-hmm. uh I'm I'm not exactly on my own, but I don't have I have I am have I'm going to have to shoulder a larger degree of responsibility for this thing than I thought I was going to have to. Yes. Yeah, I think that's and, true. And um yeah. So, the reality is is hitting him pretty hard. I think. Yeah, um, you know, I do want to say though that even though they had that exchange, and then in the in the in the, at the end of the last chapter, Gildor, um, you know, Frodo and Gildor have that little witty exchange. Um, uh, you know, Gildor says, um, "Do not meddle in the affairs of wizards, for they are subtle and quick mm-hmm. to anger." And then Frodo re- retorts, "Go not to the elves for counsel, for they will say both no and yes." Yes. Um, they're, they're like trading in proverbs, mm-hmm. and um, but I do want to say as much as Fro- you're like you hear Frodo say that, and you're like, "Burn," you know, <laughs> like there's there's a lot of wisdom in Gildor's mentality because um, he's he's basically saying, "I'm not sure, I'm not sure what to do, and I'm not sure about your questions, and I'm not sure about mm-hmm. what to tell you." And when you're not sure, it's probably better to hold your tongue. You know? Yeah, no, I think that's true. Um, yeah. You know, you don't want to be the cause, the alarmist that causes people to go and take and take the wrong turn. So there's just, they're dealing in so much ambiguity. I mean, really, you know, the, the woods here are kind of, um, a, you know, figurative for where, you know, Frodo is, um, I, I guess, spiritually, right? Like where he is. Mm. Just in terms of trying to figure out where what he needs to do, Mm -hmm. right? Kind of confused and disoriented, and yeah, yeah, Yeah. not sure. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good thought. Yeah. Um, so I like you know you said you talked earlier about Sam's development, and Mm -hmm. I really liked this little bit, or it's again Mm -hmm. just a little bit after what uh, what we were just talking about, right? Yeah. Um, Frodo asks him. uh, I think it's Frodo. Yeah. Do you feel any need to leave the Shire now, now that your wish to see them has the elves has come true already? Mm-hmm. And Sam says, yes, sir. I don't know how to say it, but after last night I feel different. I seem to see ahead in a kind of way. I know we are going to take a very long road into darkness, but I know I can't turn back. It isn't to see elves now, nor dragons, nor mountains that I want. I don't rightly know what I want. But I have something to do before the end, and it lies ahead, not in the Shire. I must see it through, sir, if you understand me. Um, you know, so you can see already in Sam this, like, you know, before he was just so excited to go see the elves yeah. and now he's seen the elves and Frodo's like, so now that you've seen the elves, are you going to stay? Do you want to stay here? And Sam, it's like Sam by meeting the elves has developed this sense that he has, he's, has a higher calling, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. that he's called to something that he doesn't know how to explain it, but he just has this. He has this feeling. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, that's something that I think lots of people can relate to. Um, you're faced with a, you, you find yourself suddenly faced with a problem that you weren't expecting to get wrapped up in. And all of a sudden you're, um, you know, you maybe, you maybe deal with the, the initial problem, but then you're like, it just opens up this whole other thing and you're like, I feel like this is this was the turning point in something that I'm called to that's much greater. Mm-hmm. You know, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's it's funny how that works. So yes, how trials can be. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that's definitely something I've experienced in my own life. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in the in the last year. Um, but I'm sure there's a number of other you know people that could relate to that as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, you maybe deal with that initial problem. Yep. Uh, or you you have that initial fulfillment, but it exposes you to things that you weren't expecting. Right. And other realities, or even you just there's you develop this unrest from it, and 
maybe you maybe you do check that box on your bucket list and you're like wait was that I, I built this up to be that amazing yeah. thing in my mind and I just did it and now is that all where do is? I go from here yeah right. it's, it's kind of like you peaked right yeah. and you're like mm, nowhere to go but down do I just go <laughs> die now like right like, right yeah, that would be the depressing thing, right? Like, to complete all the things on your bucket list and be like, oh, now what? <laughs> right, right. My bucket list part due, uh, you know, I'm, yeah. You know, I, I totally get what you're saying. Yeah. Um, um, I, I just, I love those words from Sam, and I think, um, you know, it's that's a that's a little bit of a, like you said, a, a, an instance of his development further. Yeah, and it's almost like he's, I mean, I would think we talked the last chapter too, and he is still very subservient. You know, there's definitely like there's a hierarchy that's evident, mm-hmm. and, and Sam's at the bottom. But I feel like here, you feel him inching his way up. Mm-hmm. You know, like he's, he's, he's still, you know, obviously he's still there to serve and help Frodo, but you, he kind of takes a... He, he, he takes a step up, in my opinion. Yeah. You know, like, he's not just this, you know, clueless gardener who's along for a fun ride. You know, mm-hmm. like, he's, he's there. He's, he's there for the right reason, and he's staying. And what I thought was interesting, too, is I think, didn't this whole conversation begin between him and Frodo? Because Frodo had basically made up his mind that he was going to, he wanted to go by himself. He was like, I can't do this to my friends. Right? Mm-hmm. Didn't he, did, wasn't he basically trying to give Sam an out? Um, I think so. I, you know, I think, um, uh, um, I, I think Frodo at every step of the way is, is trying to find a way to just take the shoulder of the burden himself because he doesn't want any, he doesn't want others to feel burdened with it. Right. Right. And I don't think he wants that responsibility. I don't think he wants mm-hmm. to feel like he's the reason that these, that these guys that he you know that that these guys are giving up all the comforts of home quite possibly never to return again, you know. Um, he says to take them into exile where hunger and weariness may have no cure. It's quite another, even if they are willing to come. Like I don't think he wants. I don't think he wants that on his conscience. Right. He doesn't want to be that guy. You know. Yeah. So. Yeah. But. But, um, but the elves told Sam, of course, don't you leave him. Right. Right. Yep. And Sam's not going to leave him. Yeah. Um. So, um, so yeah, great, great development with Sam. Mm -hmm. Um, I, uh, so, you know, we talked to, we talked some about a few of the proverbs that Frodo and, and Gildor traded in. And Mm -hmm. again, um, there's some proverbs in this chapter and I love, I love how, I think that, I think they're properly called proverbs, but maybe a listener can correct us as to what exactly they're called, but. Um, just these little, I, I love this little, like, um, shortcuts make long delays. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and it got me thinking at how hobbits seem to be naturally good at proverbs and riddles, right? Yes. Gollum, or mm-hmm. Gollum and, and Bilbo are able to engage in a battle of riddles with each mm-hmm. other in The Hobbit. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, it just it got me thinking about how poor I am at, like, Expressing, like I, it's like I know the concepts of a lot of proverbs, but to be able to say them, just like rattle them off. Yeah, I can't do that. You know, yeah, no, I can't either. Not like the hobbits seem to be able to. Yeah, and I and there are people out there that seem like they can do that. You know, they can just rattle, but it, but it seems like they're often older people and they yeah. who aren't as who maybe, and I don't know why that is. I I'm just shooting. I'm just kind of thinking out loud here, but maybe that has to do with us being so glued into having information poured into us via the TV and the internet and everything. Um, whereas, you know, people in earlier generations were more used to conversation and, you know, trading in these little kind of like just little bits of practical wisdom, mm-hmm. um, back and forth. Yeah, I think that's right. I think you're so, right. I think you're right. I don't know. Just a thought. Something I picked up on. Yeah. Um, well, we also had a lot more opportunities to just talk, sit around, talk and read and, you know, I mean, I think that they were probably just better at communication as a whole you know, because of that. Mm-hmm. They didn't have all the crazy technology that we have today. Yeah, most definitely. Um, so, <clears throat> the Black Riders um, show up a little bit in this chapter, but not, not like directly. They're, you know, they see them at a distance. They hear 
um, they hear a call or a signal that they're like, what the heck is that? A long drawn wail came down the wind, like the cry right. of some evil and lonely creature. Um, you know, just this, and, and it's, and it's right on the heels as they're like having a good time because they're drinking this elvish. Yeah. Liqueur. I want to know what that is. I want the recipe. It <laughs> well, sounds it says, delicious. It had the scent of a honey made of many flowers and was wonderfully refreshing. Mm-hmm. And uh, it put them all drink. in a good mood, even Frodo. So you yeah. know there must have been something special about it. Yeah, I like it says, very soon they were laughing and snapping their fingers at rain and at black riders. <laughs> I just like the image <laughs> of like... Snapping their fingers at rain. You know there was something good in there. Bring it on, black riders. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like... <laughs> and they're like... <laughs> <laughs> they get quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> Don't bring it on. It's like taunting the bully. Yeah, exactly. The bully exactly. starts chasing you and you turn and run away. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, very, very scary, but they managed to make their way through the woods mm-hmm. to uh, Farmer Maggot's house. Yes. And... Um, but should I just say that story that Frodo shared about why he was so scared of Farmer Maggot, I thought was hilarious. Oh, yeah? What did you find hilarious about it? I just, I could just, like, picture the whole thing happening in my head, and I was just like, that, I mean, you know, it was, it was a very, like, um, Peter Rabbit kind of thing, you know, uh-huh. like, <laughs> sneaking into, um, into the garden and taking what wasn't his, and then, um being beaten and scared by the dogs. I mean, it, it felt like a Hobbit version of Peter Rabbit, and I thought it was funny. Right, all right. Yes. Um, no, I, yeah, I, I can see that. Um, yeah. But, you know, the guy's protective of his mushrooms, and I get that. Mm-hmm. If I had mushrooms like his, I'd be protective I mean, of them, too. All right, so I guess, I guess you can cultivate mushrooms. I mean... It, are mushrooms really things something you can farm? Because I know my one experience of like harvesting mushrooms was when we were in what the Adirondacks is that where we were? Oh yeah, near Peekskill. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, did you go? I don't think I went. Yeah, and we like went up into the hills, into like these foothills, and we just started looking for morels, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, and we just found lots of random morels. It mm-hmm. wasn't like they were just out in the woods. You know, they mm-hmm. weren't like on That's a farm. That's how they grow. Somewhere. It's really hard. You, it's almost it's it's very tricky to grow mushrooms. Like it's because mm-hmm. they're so persnickety. Um, like there's a farm nearby actually that they just started growing. They they started growing mushrooms the last few years, and it's really fascinating to go and just learn about everything it takes to grow. A mushroom mm-hmm. because like the soil is you know like the pH of the soil has to be perfect the humidity has to be perfect I mean they were in like this special like specially made greenhouse I mean it's not like you can just you know grow a mushroom like it's, it's not like a potato where you can just stick in a little you know spud and out comes a potato I mean they're right. incredibly picky about their conditions and yeah. so if you have a good mushroom that that's you know wild mushrooms are called wild mushrooms because they're that's where they are. They just appear in the woods. Right. Right. And so I think they are, they are really, and they, it's not like they're, um, they're going to be a never ending supply. I mean, they're going to run out at some point. Right. So I, I can sympathize with farmer maggot is what I'm saying. So I know how. Yeah. Well, I just thought, um, I, I, I didn't, I wasn't aware, I guess that you could cultivate mushrooms. Although I guess I sort of assumed you had to be able to, cause you can buy big things of them at the store. Um, well, like the really just boring ones, right? Yeah, you can. But like the really, that's why morels and um, truffles, truffles are yeah. like we take like hundreds of dollars per pound. Yeah, because you can't, you can't harvest. Oh, yeah, them. I remember we just collected like maybe a bucket full, and I mean you um, can't grow and, them. And that's what I mean. We were, we were like the, uh, your cousin who we were with was mm-hmm. basically saying that um, if if we were to take this to like the city to a restaurant in the city. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we could get several hundred dollars for this yeah. bucket mm-hmm. of of morels, and that's why because you can't grow them, you can't yeah. cultivate them on your own. Yeah, because they do they grow wild. Right. And so, farmer maggot obviously has a very productive mush. He happens to live near a very productive mushroom patch, and that's something special. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Cool. I did not know that. I do wish that Tolkien had specified what kind of mushrooms. I was like, are they oyster mushrooms? Are they shiitakes? Are they mo- what are they? Yeah, well, they're probably some kind of ancient breed of they mushroom that, you know, that no I've longer never heard is around. Of before and probably couldn't pronounce. That's right. Yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> all right. So, um, so a little thing here um, that I noticed. Uh, wait, I have something marked that I thought that's different from what I was thought I was going to say. Um, we'll come back to that. Jumping a little bit ahead in the Farmer Maggot episode. Mm-hmm. Um, Farmer Maggot says, uh, then I'll tell you what, um, Frodo says, I don't know what to think about kind of what their next step should be. And, um, uh, oh, or, I'm sorry, he tells him the story about the Black Rider coming to visit. Farmer Maggot, Farmer Maggot tells the story about the Black Rider right. coming to visit him. Yeah. And then he basically says, um, Frodo says, I don't know what to think of that. And, you know, Frodo has to kind of play it play it cool. He can't give away too much information, right, about what, what he's up to. Everybody's supposed to think he's just moving to Buckland. Mm-hmm. And apparently even Pippin thinks that, right? Yes. Um, yep. You know, he's basically saying, well, if you're going to be moving back to Buckland, you better get on good graces with Farmer Maggot, right. you know? Right, yeah. Um, only Sam really really knows, I think, that there's something else involved in this. Right. Um, the Farmer Maggot says to Frodo, I'll tell you what to think. You should never have gone mixing yourself up with Hobbits and folk, Mr. Frodo. Folk are queer up there. And um, and then Stan, <laughs> Sam, of course, stirs in his chair like them's fighting work, you know. Yes. Um, but but um, <laughs> what's really interesting about that is if you go back to the first chapter, um, very early on in chapter one, um, there's this exchange. But what about this Frodo that lives with him? Asked Old Noakes of Bywater. Baggins is his name, but he's more than half a brandy buck, they say. It beats me why any Baggins of Hobbiton would go should go looking for a wife away there in Buckland where folks are so queer. <laughs> <laughs> and no wonder they're queer, put in Daddy Twofoot, the gaffer's next door neighbor. If they live on the wrong side of the Brandywine River and ride again the old forest, that's a ba- dark bad place if half the tales be true. You're right, Dad, said the gaffer. Not that the brandy bucks of Buckland live in the old forest. But they're a queer breed, seemingly. They fool about with boats on that big river, and that isn't natural. So, anyway, it's, funny. I, it's just funny to me that um, the feeling is obviously mutual. It you is, know? yeah. yeah. Um, you know, you have this sense, it's, even though they're really not very far apart, you have this same sense of, like, um, just local local flavor and of mm-hmm. being suspicious of the next town over and of mm-hmm. the weird people over there in that mm-hmm. next town and mm-hmm. uh, and those sorts of things. Um, yeah. Again, just, I, I think a funny little indication of how um, is parochial the right term, maybe? They, mm, yeah. They, the, the hobbits are. Um, the hobbits tend to be. Yeah. Um, and that all the stuff that we heard about the people in Buckland being so strange in the first chapter the people in Buckland think the same of people from Hobbiton. Yeah. Um, at the same time. Right. So. Right. It's kind of like an old, uh, like you know, it feels like some kind of like 1950s like high school rivalry, like between two small towns <laughs> in Indiana or something like that. I can see. Oh, that. them Hickory boys! You don't even want to know what they do with their free time. You boys better beat them in the upcoming high school basketball game, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it just it just feels like that to me, you know, like. Oh, yeah, I, I, I can get that. Yeah, I see what you're saying. That is funny. Yeah. It is, it's yeah. kind of that, uh, even like kind of a Friday Night Lights vibe to it or something like that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. I'm, I'm just rambling. Sure All right. Um, I just thought that was really funny. The, they, that the first chapter they're talking about the weirdos in Buckland, and then yes, and this then chapter they're talking about the weirdos, about the weirdos back in, in Hobbiton. Hobbiton. Yeah, I'm impressed that you remember that little tidbit from chapter one, because I totally didn't. Yeah, well. Yeah. But that's why they call you the Tolkien mm-hmm. nerd. That's why I call you the Tolkien nerd. <laughs> the Tolkien nerd. I think you should change the podcast name. Too. Maybe. Okay. Anyways, um, yeah, I thought it was. I thought it was interesting. The, um, you know, how um, Farmer Maggot describes the Black Rider. And I'm actually kind of surprised that he wasn't more scared of him, to be quite honest. Like, if a guy like yeah. that showed up at my door, I would have slammed the door in his face and gone and, like, locked myself in the bathroom and called 911. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't even have carried on a conversation with him, you know? And instead, Maggie goes up to him and's like, hey, how you doing? Yeah. You're not from around here, are you? Well, <clears throat> so, it's interesting. I, I read um, in Unfinished Tales... Um, which is one of the history of Middle Earth books. It's it's probably the more readable of them all, um, but there's actually a section that talks about the Black Riders, and it's like 
Tolkien wrote kind of a little story about their search, their hunt for the ring. Okay. And it's it's almost like it's this all told from their perspective. Oh, and um, and essentially, like they are, they're really, they're trying to, it, they 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 can't help but give off some sense of like dread and fear wherever they go, mm-hmm. but uh, or like induce in the people around them some sense of uh, fear and dread. Right. But they're really trying to not. They're obviously powerful beings, but they're really trying hard not to, like, get too aggressive. Okay. Because they don't want to attract the attention of the wise and I the powerful see. to what's going on there, right? It would be kind of yeah. ideal. Sauron had basically, he basically got the intel that said the ring might be in the Shire. And, um, and he didn't, he, he had some names and... That was about it, and okay. so he sent the Black Riders there to try to find him, but to keep it, it was kind of like a a special ops mission, right? Okay. They can't they can't be too noisy about it, right? It. They just kind of, they can't um, if they're too aggressive, they're too assertive. If they go like mowing down Farmer Maggot and all the mm-hmm. other hobbits as they try mm-hmm. to search for the ring, then you know Sauron would lose the advantage he had of you know maybe the others don't know I of what see. it is of what's okay. there. You know that makes sense. That's a, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, I can see how that. Yeah, and, and I mean, they're almost trying. They're almost, you know, it's almost like they're doing um, between Gandalf and Sauron are almost playing kind of like this, um, chess you know, game. this this chess game, like this mm-hmm. black ops sort of intelligence mm-hmm. game. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> like mm-hmm. who's going to make the next wrong move? You know, or, or who's yeah. going to give away the secrets? Yeah. Yep. Um, Although I'm not sure that Sauron knows that Gandalf is playing at this point. At least not. I don't think he knows for sure that Gandalf has all the information okay. he does. Okay. Um, well, it makes sense because they're, they're still very early on in their search. You know, I mean, it's, I'm sure Sauron probably feels like he's got all the time in the world. Mm-hmm. Right? He probably feels like it's going to be pretty easy um, yeah. to get the ring back. A little does he know. Um, so I remember the thing that I had referenced in the margins of my book and um, it was actually something extracurricular. So I was, as I was looking and trying to figure out where Farmer Maggot's name came from, mm-hmm. um, you know, I couldn't find anything specific. But I went back and again looked at the Return of the Shadow or the um, Shadow of the, Re- the, Re- the Return of the Shadow, which is oh. the the history of Middle Earth book that I, I have. Okay. <clears throat> and um, it actually talks about uh, that when Farmer Maggot was originally written, he would he was a Hobbit, and then. And then later on, of course, you know, you, because you read the book before, but uh, this character Tom Bombadil comes into the story in a couple of chapters. And when Tolkien, when he was writing the first draft, when he wrote the Tom Bombadil thing, mm-hmm. he he started thinking that he was going to make Farmer Maggot like a of the same race of being as Tom Bombadil instead of just a lowly hobbit. Oh. Um, so for a while, Farmer Maggot was conceived of as like this, you know, greater sort of being that we'll find Tom Bombadil to be. Um, still still in certain ways maybe hobbit like, but but like like supernatural okay. <laughs> hobbit like. Um, okay. and um, and so for a while Farmer Maggot was intended to be that way, but I guess it's in the final final revision Tolkien decided to just make him um, just another right. hobbit. But maybe maybe with a little bit maybe a little bit more significant than just your average hobbit. Um, okay. And we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the Tom Bombadil okay. chapters. Yeah, so Sounds just interesting good. little note there, interesting that little is, tidbit. Yeah, that is that's very interesting. Um, yeah, you know what I thought of when I read um, the little tape, <laughs> the description of the table setting that Mrs. Maggot brought out. What uh, it says: one or two other hobbits belonging to the farm household came in. In a short while, fourteen sat, sat down to eat. Uh, there was beer in plenty and a mighty dish of mushrooms and bacon, besides much other solid farmhouse fare. The dogs lay by the fire and gnawed rinds and cracked bones. And I just read that, and uh, that made me think of Cracker Barrel for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> like that just seems like the vibe that solid Cracker Barrel, farmhouse fare. you know, like is yeah. trying to get like they've got the they've got like the uh, the big fireplace and all that kind mm-hmm. of stuff, and um, you the know, stick to your ribs. Like yeah. keep you full for days. Food, yeah. yeah. Now I can totally see that. But yeah, it's funny when I read that. And I read about the mighty dish of mushrooms and bacon. I was like, oh. your mouth was watering. My I'm mouth sure. was totally watering. I was like, that. Oh man, I bet this woman could cook because she knew <laughs> that mushrooms and bacon went really well together. 
Nice. Which they do. Yeah, I know. I, I found myself wishing it was there. Next day, next time you order pizza, you can get mushrooms and bacon on it. I think I did. You can get ask. You can say, "I'll take, it. I'll take the Mrs. Maggot special." <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be like, "What?" <laughs> Like, you want, up on me. You want maggots on your pizza? What? Mm, gross. No, I, I thought I thought that sounded really delicious, and I wished I was there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well. Um. So they meet up with Mary at the end of the chapter. Um, Can I just say real quick? Yeah, I go ahead. really thought it was very generous of Farmer Maggot to offer to give them a ride to the ferry. I really did. Mm-hmm. I thought. I mean, I'm I'm a complete scaredy cat. But I was like, I kind of felt like he was in a way taking his life in his hands. Yeah, I agree. To do with that. that, and well, especially knowing that you know those that the Black Rider had come by and kind of harassed him. Right, you know? right. I mean, it was dark and foggy. I mean, I felt like the stage was being set for something very bad to happen, and I found myself just praying that Father Maggot, Farmer Maggot, would get back alive. Yeah, because it just it just seemed like a very you know, brave thing for him to do. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I don't know that Mary. I don't know that they would have made it without him. To be quite honest. Yeah, and I think. Well, I mean, I think that's why he helped him. Was yeah. he realized like if this black, you know, it's almost like providential that the black rider did show up at Farmer Maggot's first mm-hmm. and gave Farmer Maggot this bad impression um, because he had because he knew what kind of danger they were in. I don't know that's that. True. Fro- again, I don't know that Frodo and the other hobbits would have been like willing to just flat out ask Farmer Maggot to help them in this oh, way. You're right. That's a really good point. Um, yeah. Yeah. Kind of gave him a feeling for, you know, kind of the dire straits that they were in. And I love that they gave him a basket of mushrooms at the, at yes. the end. <laughs> I was like, that's great. That's the perfect way to end the chapter. The scent of mushrooms was rising. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, again, yeah, um, I ask you, is a way of wrapping up, what was this chapter about? This chapter, it was about friends. Uh huh. And um, unlikely heroes. Unlikely heroes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And mushrooms. Yeah, and I think end. I think this may be one of the most uh, Tolkienian chapters of all um, because it just is. You know, like it's just mm-hmm. there's like no pretense in this chapter. Mm-hmm. Um, it is just like it is a continuation of the story and it is a furthering of the sense of of reality yes. you know in the yes. story um, yes. by getting very into the mundane details mm-hmm. and it's just amazing to me that a you know a book goes from having this chapter on um a mushroom farmer you know to dealing with you know the great powers of of the world you know in a couple of chapters you know but see, I think that's what keeps you them. going because you, you need that balance. You do. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know I do. Because I, I just get exhausted if it's just go, 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 go. Right? If it was just dealing with the powers of the world the whole time, I'd be like, I'm a, I can't take this anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, it would just be too stressful. Yeah. So you need, you need chapters about mushroom farmers to just kind of get chill, you know. Yeah, and it's a reminder of that, you know, that thing we read from the Waldman letter way back um, in one of the early episodes where... Um, Tolkien, you know, Tolkien says that um, he's convinced that the um, the you know the great movements of history are often not the Lord the doings of the lords and the governors, but by the but basically by the little people. Yes. You know, yep. um, those who are seem insignificant and weak to mm-hmm. the wise. Absolutely. You know? Yep. So. Very true. All right. All right. Well, uh, next time we shall do chapter five. And uh, mulling over where to transition back to the Silmarillion for a, for a little bit, okay. um, but we'll see. I think we got enough, several more chapters left in Fellowship, so Good. fear not. That makes my heart not. happy. Yeah, and um, hey, like I said, go over and check out TrueMyths.org org um, for latest articles, and um, uh, check out check out Tolkien's Requiem, and um, send us some haikus. Yes. And uh, let us know what you thought of the haiku music, assuming you could hear it well. And, um, you know, if, if any of you v- object vehemently to um, to our choice, uh, you're free to voice your opinion and, and why. And if the uh, rationale is good enough, we might even reconsider it. So, I don't know if we go that far, but yeah. we'd still love to hear what you think. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Greta. Thank you, John. This was delightful. Yes. 
Now go eat some mushrooms. Oh, I wish I had some in the house. All right. I should eat the ones in our backyard, though. No, definitely not. That could be bad. Yeah. All right. Or good and then bad. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Be very careful when foraging for mushrooms. All right. Don't eat the wild mushrooms. Yeah. Um, What you're doing. Yeah. Um, All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening. And we'll talk at you next time. Bye, y'all. Bye-bye. Please remember to check out truemyths.org for show notes as well as other Tolkien goodness. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, would you please leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback on iTunes? It's a great way to support the show and only takes a minute or two. On the next episode, we continue our discussion of The Lord of the Rings with Chapter 5 of Fellowship, A Conspiracy Unmasked. Please tune in, and thanks for listening.